So welcome everybody. It's a huge pleasure to welcome you to the first of our Fintorn Talks series. It's a little bit like TEDx, but better. And uh, my name is Robin Alfred. I have the great privilege of emceeing the evening. We'll start with any logistical things we need to deal with. So as I said, for those of you who are already here, if you don't want to be on film, the evening is being live streamed and also recorded. So if you don't want to be on film, please sit in one of the two back rows. And if you hear a fire alarm, there probably is a fire, and you should go out through one of the fire exits, which is this place, this place, and this place. It is not the other one over there. Do not go up that staircase. And the bathrooms are to the back here and also downstairs. So for those of you who are new to Fintorn and those of you who are on the live stream, we have over 100 people on the live stream from all around the world. Big welcome to you. And we like to start our events in Fintorn with a moment of silence. So I want to invite you into that. And we have a moment of silence just to bring ourselves fully present. Letting go of the business of the day so far. An opening to an evening of insight, exploration, learning, sharing, connection, and common purpose. And let's also give thanks that we can come together in safety and security in a place like this to explore in this ways, in these ways, knowing that this is a great privilege. And let's also ask that it may be of benefit to all beings seen and unseen. Thank you. Yeah, so again, a huge welcome to all of you to Fintorn Talks. And um, we are generously sponsored by four organizations. We're sponsored by the Fintorn Foundation, in whose premises we are currently assembled. We are sponsored by AES Solar, solar panel producer, founded here. Founded here and still running, uninterrupted for 40 years, the only um, manufacturers of solar panels in the UK. So a great achievement to do that and we're very grateful to AES Solar for sponsoring us also. Sponsored also by the Phoenix Shop and Cafe, also founded here, our part-owned community stores and lovely cafe which you can also avail yourself of in the interval. And we are also sponsored and generously underwritten by the Hygieia Foundation. So many thanks to all of our sponsors for enabling this evening to happen. Maybe we can give them a round of applause. Yeah. So the format of our evening is we're going to have four talks. They last up to 20 minutes. Each speaker has 20 minutes to use as they wish. Some may use the full 20 minutes. Some may use part and have some Q&A as part of that, some question and answer. We'll have three talks before the interval. We will then have a 20 minute interval. After the interval, we'll have some musical entertainment, which will also involve you. And then we'll have our fourth talk and we will close with 20 to 30 minutes of a panel discussion and question and answer session. So it should be a great evening. I'm very excited about the evening. Actually, I've looked through the biographies. I know some of the people who are presenting very well and I think it's going to be a cracking evening. So I think we've got a really great start to the Fintorn Talks series. And I don't think there's more I need to say except to move into introducing our first speaker. And our first speaker is Daniel Val. Daniel was uh, living at Fintorn with his wife for about three and a half years. It seems like a lot longer in the nicest possible way because he did so much. He was the co-director of the Fintorn College. He set up um, a master's in sustainable community design with Harriet Watt University. He brought the Bioneers event to Fintorn. He brought a series of visitors from the California Institute of Integral Studies. He did a lot of stuff when he was here and it's great to welcome you back. He also comes back now with a 14-month-old baby. 
Lucia, who took her first steps walking today. So a huge achievement to also come back as a dad. And Daniel is described as a whole systems design specialist and regenerative development generalist. And he's a, an author, a blogger, an educator, consultant, and um, now lives in Mallorca, which he's seeing and contributing to as a sustainable bioregion. So Daniel's talk is called Human and Planetary Health, Ecosystem Restoration at the Dawn of the Century of Regeneration. And let's give a very warm welcome back to Fintorn to Daniel Val. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah, exciting day watching my daughter take her first. Well, she's taken the odd step, but she actually walked today. Um, so nice to be back at Findhorn. It's really nice to be in this space. Um, I must have spent at least 100, if not 200 hours dancing five rhythms on this floor. So if I some, suddenly start spiraling, um, stop me. Um, so, I'm, oops, let me just, why is this not working? Okay, a little technical problem here. Do you know why this is not working? <laughs> it is on. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, maybe I'll just get started. Um, this is a very special time, like seeing my daughter walk today, I really feel like asking myself what future is she working, walking into and well, not work working. But, uh, okay, this is really interesting because for the longest time I didn't really want to use the slide uh, set, I just thought I don't need a slide set and um, then we went back and forth a number of times and it seems like I might be asked not to use it. <laughs> Robin, I think you might have to give me a couple of minutes. You can have, you can have more than your uh, 20 minutes okay. now. Yeah. I think we'll be very generous to you about that. So, the talk's subject is about human and planetary health. and. I've been exploring this for a number of years. I did a PhD on this subject in 2006. And for three years I was working on a PhD thinking it was about design for sustainability. Are we getting there? Should we? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's start in the order of the slides. Um, just very briefly, this is where I come from, um, there, Mallorca. The reason why I like starting with this slide of planet Earth is it shows the atmosphere and how thin that layer of life, of biosphere actually is, within which we take our home and within which everything, every love, every war, every bit of human history has taken place. And there's not a thing that you and I can do that doesn't affect the health and wholeness of this place. And unfortunately, we've come through centuries and millennia of not being very wise about how we behave within that living planet. We are now in an age that some people like to call the Anthropocene, where we've become a geological force. We are shaping the planet and have an enormous impact on biodiversity on um, climate change and all these issues. We, um, these slides might be... What's going on now? Um, these slides might be familiar to you. This is the planetary boundaries graphic that shows that we're already beyond certain planetary boundaries, that if we don't draw back within the safe limit, we might not have a future. And um, there's lots of things coming together, ecological crises, economic crises, social crises. 
And my friend and mentor, Fritjof Capra, once said that if you follow the river of these crises upstream, you meet a crisis of consciousness, a crisis of perception, a crisis of how we see ourselves and our role in this living planet. Also, we're living on an incredibly unequal planet. If you sum up the two layers of this graph, which is produced by Credit Suisse, every two years, 8.6% um, of humanity own 85.6% of the wealth, which is staggering. But what's even more staggering is that 71% of humanity have to share 2.7% of the wealth. We cannot create a sustainable planet or a sustainable future for humanity with this inequity. And we wouldn't want to sustain a humanity that is that, unequal. Just at the beginning of this week, the IPCC, the panel on climate change, released another report saying, while we're completely off target on what was agreed in Paris with a two degree target, it's actually not enough. We need to radically reduce carbon emission and actually do more than that. We need to reverse carbon emission to avoid what this recent paper by the Stockholm Resilience Center again, whoops, um, here, hothouse earth. We're, we're on this path and if we don't manage to take the detour onto this sem semi-stable ledge, we're dropping into this abyss. And a lot of the voices, about two, two um, weeks ago, the um, Secretary General of the United Nations said that we've got about a, a year and a half to take drastic action. This report, again, very conservative, talking about 12 years. I actually think we're already in the middle of what's called runaway climate change. That image up there with the lakes, that, that's um, the permafrost melting. That's, these lakes are bubbling like a little soda pop, gassing off-gassing methane and um, the circulatory cur um, currents in the oceans are slowing down. We're basically faced with a, a runaway cycle now where climate change is getting worse even if we start paddling back. So even if we do all the things I'm going to be talking about this evening, we are facing three decades of collapse, but that collapse is the collapse of an old system that no longer serves that we need to go through in order to give birth to a new humanity that sees itself again as part of the community of life. So even if we get everything right, we'll still face three decades of quite severe upheaval. We need to go upstream and look at this crisis of perception. We need to start thinking about how do we re tell the story of who we are, why we are here, and what we could do if we actually lived in a way that is creating conditions conducive to life. One of my mentors, Janine Benius, the founder of the biomimicry work, says life creates conditions conducive to life. This is in a nutshell what we should be doing. I would also say that life, in a nutshell, is a regenerative community. We need to rejoin that community. And to do that, we need to change the stories we tell about ourselves, and we need to change the organizing ideas that shape our perception. And what do I mean by that? Have a look at that. Some of you are seeing the head of an animal, some of you are just seeing a black circle a white circle with black dots in it. If I give you the organizing idea, head of a giraffe, ah, some people go, ooh, I can see it. This is the neck, these are the horns, this is the snout, the eyes, so she's looking down this way. This is just to show that Organizing ideas are incredibly powerful. We don't see things because they're out there and they just come in. We see things because we have ideas about what's out there and we make the world. We bring forth a world together in conversation. And that's the power of reshaping the world for us as well. 
One of the big stories that we've been told is that life is all about survival of the fittest and the struggle for survival in a, on a planet with scarce resources. That's not true. Life is a process that acts through diversification and subsequent reintegration of that diversity at higher levels of complexity. And more often than not, this is done through new, new forms of collaboration. This is what we are challenged to do now. We have to, and it seems impossible when we look at the current news in Brazil, in America, so, so many places we seem to be going in the exact opposite direction. But we have to, and this is really, let this one sink in, we now have to do the impossible because the probable is unthinkable and unconscionable. We have to do the impossible. So maybe it's good to be here at Findhorn, where one of the taglines is often, expect a miracle, we need one. Whoops, another good friend of the community, um, Robert Gilman, sketches it out in this way. He talks about the era, the tribal era, that humanity went through, and then with the onset of agriculture, which to some extent was also the onset of us beginning to exploit the planet in a way that wasn't very wise. We became able to settle and the era of empires started. We started to build cities, we started to create nations and empires that went to war against each other. So we began a war against nature and then we began a war against ourselves. And then he, um, Robert speaks about this moving into what is called the planetary era. And what I like about this graph is that in many ways the, the Renaissance seems that with the um, scientific revolution a new type of technology was made possible that then made it possible to destroy the planet much faster. But at the same time, through science, the same science that gave us destructive technologies also gave us an understanding of being part of this living planet. And this transition out of the era of empire into the planetary era, to us, with our 70, 80, 85, 90 year lifespans, seems very, short, uh, very long. But really, it's short for a complete transformation of our civilizational presence on Earth. And that sometimes gives me hope that we're now at the end of this large transition area and that we just need to understand that what seems like nothing is moving is actually part of a larger process. So we are moving into the planetary era. This is me in 2006, just before I moved to Findhorn. Um, the two big books in my hand are volume one and volume two of that PhD I mentioned earlier. Um, Design for Human and Planetary Health, a Holistic Integral Approach to Complexity and Sustainability. Sounds very academic. Um, What's amazing about this is that, that when I came to Finton, I, like when I finished the PhD, I couldn't find any way to do postdoctoral research because nobody wanted to fund me because it was too transdisciplinary and I was sent from one funding council to the other. And so I kind of put it in a drawer, came to Finton, where to some extent I was in those days even, it was good to hide your PhD because there was a bit of an attitude that if you had a PhD, you were in your head and therefore you couldn't be in your heart and you probably weren't spiritual. And, and it took a while to... Um, <laughs> here's a man who's lived this for 50 years, Roger. <laughs> so um, I don't think it's like that. Um, but yeah, just recently, this summer, I had a phone call from a man who said, um, my name is Anthony Capon. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Sydney. I'm in Europe for a number of weeks because of two conferences and in between those two conferences I would really love to come and see you and I said okay um, that's uh, interesting yeah let's let's meet and so he came to Mallorca and he is the co-author of a report that came out in 2017 by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet the top medical journal that is called Pl planetary health and this whole meme that I wasn't actually aware of because I stopped following it, has grown enormously in the last three, four, five years. Um, there's a whole field of medicine now that understands that there's a deep link between 
ecosystems health and planetary health. Health actually is, and this is, comes from my PhD, is a emergent property of complex dynamic systems at different levels of scale. So a healthy cell sits in a healthy organ, in a healthy body, in a healthy family, in a healthy community, in a healthy bioregion, in a healthy ecosystem, on a healthy planet. And of course it goes the other way around. If we do anything that is unhealthy at any of those levels, it affects all other levels. I came to call planetary health, or I, I, I kept working in this field, but um, a couple of years ago I, I um, published a book called Designing Regenerative Cultures, because this idea of regeneration is also about health. The idea of resilience is also about health. And um, in this, this book, the, the title of this book also kind of harbors a somewhat paradox, which is that I, on the one hand, we need to redesign the human pleasant, uh, presence on Earth, and on the other hand, cultures aren't designed, cultures emerge through the interactions that we have with each other, the stories we tell. So, in that sense, this paradox, it, I've learned from one, one of my mentors at Schumacher College, that he said, if you step on a paradox, you can be sure to have some truth on your shoes. Uh, life is much more complicated than lin linear either or thinking. So when we work with paradoxes, we, we get closer to what truth is actually about. And the other thing that in writing the book, I realized very early on, I thought, what can I write in this book that would actually be meaningful in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years time? And at some point I realized, most of the solutions that human beings have created for themselves and for future generations, um, were created with the best of intentions. And nevertheless, so many of them have turned into today's problems. So yesterday's solutions turn into today's problems. Who are we to think that our sustainable, regenerative, green, or whatever you want to call them, solutions will not turn into problems later on? So maybe we've got it wrong as a culture that questions aren't transient means to get to better answers and better solutions. But solutions and answers are transient means to get to better questions. And maybe a wise culture, when you try to create a compass that you can hand on from one generation to the next, would actually create a set of questions to give to the next generation. How do we fit in? Who are we obliged to? Why are we here? Where are we going? What is this all about? Uh, these questions need to find new ways of meaning. My, my mentor, David Orr, once floored me with the question of saying, Daniel, before we can find the answer to questions like how and what we might have to do in order to create a sustainable human presence on Earth, we have to ask ourselves a much deeper question. And that question is, what is it about humanity that is worth sustaining? And if we find an answer to that question, then we might live our way into the future in a wiser way. Very briefly, what do I mean by regenerative? This spectrum is from a friend of mine called Bill Reed, who works with a group called the Regenesis Group. It's also been influenced by a woman called Carol Sanford. And basically it tells this, it creates a spectrum from business as usual, to green, which means doing things a little bit better, polluting a little less, using a little bit more renewable energy, um, which is part of the journey. And then we get to sustainable, which means no negative impacts, like not adding any more damage. But because we've done so much damage, we need to do more than that. So then you move into restorative, which can still be in a mindset that is humanity as power over nature. Um, man and nature, I'm saying man on purpose because they've created most of the mess. Um, and so you end up with situations where we try to create large forest plantations in the wrong place of the wrong kind of species and then they, they like eucalyptus in a water stressed area and, and they look very nice for a decade or two and then they um, die because we, we engineered an ecosystem. So once we do the reconciliatory step, shifting the organizing idea that we are actually nature, that 
we can design as nature because we're nothing but it. We are biological beings first and foremost. Then we move into working regeneratively. The oldest story of humanity is the, or written story of humanity is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it tells how the King Gilgamesh was told by Humbaba, the forest god, that he was the old powerful king, but he wasn't allowed to cut down the cedars of Lebanon. What did he do? Arrogant, won't say the word. Um, he ordered himself a, a cedar palace and killed Humbaba and cut down the forest. A modern ecologist would call this downwind desertification. Um, Humbaba's curse was, if you cut down the cedars, your rivers will run dry, your, your soil will go salty, and your empire will crumble. And that's precisely what happened. And so we now face having to go from this to this. And it is possible. This is, these are pictures from the Loos Plateau in China, John Lu, who was here at a conference, um, documented this change. Over 14 years, the Chinese managed to turn an arid desert into a fertile and productive landscape. These are also all images from that area. And it's a very large area here. There's Beijing, and this is, it, it, we're talking thousands of square kilometers. We can heal the planet, we can heal ecosystems, we, we can fit back into the community of life and create bioregion by bioregion a more abundant place, move from competitive scarcity to shared abundance. This is a wonderful image um, of a guy called Robert Zooks who, who basically um, maps the river systems of the planet. And if we move into a bioregional world, if we start regenerating bioregion by bioregion, this kind of map is very useful because the, the bioregional approach is an approach that fits humanity into natural patterns rather than the other way around. I'm going to run through this really quickly now because um, how, how much more time do I have? Five minutes, okay. Um, this was an event that I helped to organize at the Commonwealth, uh, Lady Patricia Scotland from the, um, she's, she's the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, um, giving advice to 53 governments that together um, ruled over 2.4 billion people, and um, most of them are under 30, and a lot of them are in the front line of climate change. And she's behind this idea of regenerative development. We brought key practitioners of regenerative development from all over the world together. Um, it's been a slow process in terms of what's come out of that meeting. That was two years ago. But a lot of people met and started to collaborate afterwards. What's directly come out is this platform called Common Earth that is giving advice to Commonwealth countries on how to do regenerative development and also showcasing uh, best practice examples. There's an organization in the Netherlands called Commonland who's developed um, a strategy of how to finance large-scale ecosystems rest uh, restoration and how to make it viable. Um, skip through this. They, the Commonland has four practice sites around the world where they're working with regional landowners to transform entire regions. One of them is the Alti Plateau near Murcia in, in Spain. And um, John Liu, the, the guy who also did these images of the Los Plateau has started an organization called Ecosystems Restoration Camp Foundation, which is basically inviting young people or anybody from around the world to come and learn how to be a restorer of ecosystems in that place. Um, there's an organization called the Regen Network, which are working on uh, using remote sensing, satellite images and sensors on the ground to really look at the before-after of regenerative work. Because once you can quantify and prove that you have had a regenerative effect, there are now ways of finding funding um, linked to that. And they're also working with new cryptocurrencies to basically create large funding streams into regenerative practice. Um, these are just more images of how they're doing it technically. And there's um, Peter Head, who used to run Arab Engineering, that did a, lo a lot of the early eco-cities. He now runs an organization called the Resilience Brokers. And they're starting next year on an ambitious plan to buy 20 th 
2023 have worked with 200 city regions around the planet to build resilience based on this shift towards a more bioregional biomaterials economy and the, re regenera the regeneration of, of ecosystems. You've probably heard of the, the book that Paul Hawken, who lived some years here at the um, community or, or some time, um, he published this book, Drawdown, that lists a hundred strategies of how to draw carbon out of the atmosphere. This is a lot beyond carbon. We shouldn't have carbon myopia, but right now we're faced with having to stop runaway climate change. And these techniques are proven, and governments are now beginning to roll out programs to, to work on this. Um, this network by the Capital Institute that sets itself the goal of region by region creating re regenerative economies um, has, has just launched last week. Um, there are now seven, network, uh, seven regional regeneration hubs of people working at the bioregional scale to build bioregional biomaterial economies, um, basically shifting us out of carbon. Our, our entire material culture is fossil fuel dependent. We need to move into a new type of material culture that is biomaterial based and locks carbon into everything we use. There's an organization called Regeneration International that links uh, farmers from all over the world who practice regenerative agriculture. And the map that this map shows um, where these activities happen, it's, a, it's an organization called, uh, well, Lush, the, the cosmetic companies, runs the Spring Prize that I have the honor to be on the jury of. And every um, February we meet to give away 200,000 pounds to organizations that do this work already. So there is some hope, there is some silver lining to the dark storm clouds we're facing. If you really want to stop watching the bad news, have a look at this website from the Buckman the Fuller Institute, my, my friend David McConville created a map that is a Google map and you can click on it and each point has a little video of a story of people actually doing regenerative work on the ground. And next year is the 50th anniversary of Earthrise, the first image from outer space of Earth rising above Moon. It's also the 50th anniversary of Buckminster Fuller's book, Operation Manual for Spaceship Earth. And I think we're getting closer to knowing what we need to do, and we're beginning to do it. Um, in terms of education, I mentioned Regenesis. I've, I'm now flicking through these slides very fast, um, but don't worry. On Thursday at 5 o'clock, I'm giving a webinar for an organization that I work with called Guy Education, and I have an hour to talk about the same things, but with a little more breathing in between. Um, so just to, to close, this is a great teacher who has, for years, John Macy has known that the key thing that we need to change is upstream. The key thing that we need to change starts in the human heart, in the human relationship with the earth. And I love what she says there, is that like, we've been on the path of destroying this planet for many, many years, probably about 5,000 years since the beginning of agriculture. But there's something happening right now that we're redefining our relationship to each other, to this planet, and the potential role of healing this planet. And I'm going to close with a poem that Joanna Macy translated by one of my favorite poets called Rainer Maria Rilke. And it speaks to our time. And it goes like this. Dear darkening ground, you have endured so patiently the walls we've built. Maybe you'll give the cities one more hour, cloisters and churches too. And those who labor, maybe you'll let their work grip them for another five hours or seven. Until you become forest again and water and widening wilderness. In that hour of inexplicable terror, when you take back your name from all things, give me just a little more time. Give me just a little more time so I may love the things until they're real and ripe and worthy of you. So I invite you to all love life love the opportunity of being alive. We don't know whether we're going to make this. We are undergoing a species-level rite of passage right now. 
And rites of passage mean that you, you're not allowed to know whether you're going to make it, otherwise they don't work. So we are facing a knife's edge of a future that is abundant, of collaboration with nature, or decades of decline and unspeakable, unthinkable situations that we want to avoid. And the way to start navigating the path towards the positive is to just be in love with life and each other every day a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel. What a great way to start us off and to give us such a wide-ranging take on the nature of regeneration. It's surely an idea whose time has come. And to bring your brilliant mind and also your very big heart to us. So thank you so much for that. So you know sometimes you meet someone and you feel like this is someone who really walks their talk. Someone who's got kind of soil metaphorically under their fingernails and paint smeared over their bodies. It felt like that when I met Martin Ping. I met him for the first time about four hours ago in the Universal Hall here doing his technical rehearsal. He's just come over from the States. It's his first time visiting us in Fintorn, so a huge Fintorn welcome to you. And Martin Ping is someone who has been living and working with some of the solutions in a way for the last 30 years. He's the executive director of the Hawthorne Valley Association in the United States, which is an outstanding 900-acre biodynamic farm, which is dedicated to the regeneration of self, soil, and society. It's a very integrated and extraordinary place. I haven't been there myself, but I looked at some of the videos that, that are from the, the Hawthorne Valley Association. They're, very, they're really uh, inspiring. And he's come to talk to us about that and to share some of the dreams and some of the practices that they use in the Valley Association there. He's been there teaching practical arts in the high school. He was director of facilities for a while. He's served as executive director since 2003. Currently teaches economics in grade 12. He's also a founding member of the Slow Money Movement and is a co-founder and storyteller for the Magical Puppet Tree. He's served on the boards of several not-for-profit organizations and he's also absolutely delighted to be a poppy to some grandchildren. So please give a very warm welcome, Fintorn welcome for the very first time, and we hope it will not be the last time, to Martin Ping. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> we'll see after tonight if it's the last time. <laughs> if I get invited back, <clears throat> you'll have to pardon my breathing, I, this is a really beautiful country. The weather, on the other hand, is uh, a little bit rough on my bronchial asthma, so I might be sounding a little bit labored. It's much worse, uh, it sounds much worse than it is. I like that we're sponsored by um, this solar business. I saw some solar panels on the roof, and I thought, that's really an optimist, solar panels in Scotland, because <laughs> since I've been here, it seems like sunlight is, um, an unproven theory. I, I need the clicker, right? Oh, thank you. Should work. And uh, we have so many friends in common. It's, I can't believe we haven't crossed paths before. It's amazing. I have to leave here actually early to go be with Paul Hawken at Drawdown at Omega. And of course, the Hudson Valley region and Hawthorne Valley is part of a Capital Institute's um, regenerative uh, story of place. So. We're in good com I'm in good company, and that's one of the real privileges of my life and my work, is that I get to hang out with people who are doing really uh, brilliant and beautiful things that give you permission to have hope. And being a grandpa, <clears throat> I like to maintain some hope. So also, thank you to John and Francis here for inviting me in the first place, and uh, Robin for the introduction, and Thomas for all the technical help, and Yvonne for bearing with me to get all the technical stuff to get over here. I'm really grateful to be here. I've dreamt about Finhorn. I've known about it since I was a teenager. It's really um, part of my journey, I would say. You, you probably have more to do with my commitment to living in community than you know. And that goes all the way back a long time. I uh, was thinking about speaking in Finhorn in Scotland, and I decided, well, I'll call the talk The Wealth of Places. 
And it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek nod to fellow Scott Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. And that's the same year that my fellow American, Thomas Jefferson, penned the Declaration of Independence. And I would say that these two documents have played an outsized role in how human and earth destiny have unfolded since, coming out of the Age of Enlightenment, on the heels of scientific revolution, dualism of Descartes. They really uh, set the pace for our Western, anyway, mindset around economics and polity, and have certainly produced a, a mixed bag of outcomes. And it would be obviously uh, overly simplistic to say that in the ensuing 242 years, it's been all good or all bad. But I would venture to guess that we're uh, approaching, if we haven't already hit the law of diminishing, diminishing returns, when we're gleaning the thoughts harvested from the field of our mental rational construct. Thankfully, our consciousness is not static. And it's my hope that we'll move beyond the, uh, the self-interested behavior of Smith and hyper-individuality and get to a place of, uh, shall we say, uh, enlightened reciprocity and compassionate interdependence for all living beings and for the Earth herself. So, uh, since this is a story of place, we'll start with our place. And uh, Daniel mentioned this Earthrise photo. I'll say something more about it. But this is a place of, to me, inestimable, inestimable wealth and beauty. And all places have their inherent wealth. And we all come from places. So we have this in common. In the, uh, in the interest of reciprocity, I would like to invite you to my place. And that is Hawthorne Valley. And in 1984, my wife and I were uh, expecting our daughter, and we were looking for a doctor who would help us to have a home birth. And so uh, we wandered into a place called Harlemville, New York. And on that first visit, I really met the being of Hawthorne Valley. A very, very intense encounter one that is still deepening after 34 years, and one that has certainly transformed my life, our lives, I would say. Hawthorne Valley uh, is really trying to reconnect people to the earth, to each other, and to their own sense of self, and really trying to re replace us or remember us into that beautiful story that we are all participants in. And I think that all these crises that we see in this time are arising out of the, the uh, deep sense of disconnect and loss of meaningful relationship that, uh, that we can feel in these times. So it's Hawthorne Valley's work is to just simply try to provide the place and the opportunity for that reconnecting. It, it really is actually that simple. So one of our founders uh, actually wrote a little essay called um, the, Hawthorne, the Rudolf Steiner Farm School. And in it he said, what we are founding here is a seed, the seed of a living organism. The organism is essentially threefold, educational, artistic and agricultural as expressions of thinking, feeling, and willing. Each needs the other if the whole is to flourish. All are interdependent. For young and old alike, this work together will create a place in which it is possible to become, in a true sense, a full human being. And I've had the privilege of the last 30 years of walking to work each day to a place that has this aspirational uh, vision as its goal. We're uh, on a biodynamic farm in the uh, upper Hudson Valley, 
about two hours north of that little settlement at the bottom, New Amsterdam, New York City, okay? And uh, the interesting thing to me about the Hudson River is that the indigenous name is uh, Muhi Kunatuk, and it means the river that flows two ways. And it's actually true that from the tip of Manhattan, 134 miles inland to Troy, New York, the river is tidal. And I love this image, and I think about it all the time, that it's this constant dynamic flow. It's a watershed, it's a food shed, it's a culture shed between urban and rural. Hawthorne Valley's uh, contribution to this uh, rhythmic pulse is beginning on the land. So we uh, have our dairy herd adding fertility to the soil. And then we take the milk and we process it in our own creamery. We bottle raw milk and sell it in our store. We make a variety of uh, soft and hard cheeses and yogurt that's fairly widely distributed. We grow grains. We bake bread from those grains in our own bakery. We grow veggies and we sell the vegetables direct marketed through our CSA and then along with all of our other products uh, through a variety of green market stands throughout the New York City metro area. We have pigs, we have chickens, we have sheep, oops, and uh, we have horses. We produce a line of lacto-fermented veggies. And you can get all of these products and many other products from many other producers and farmers in our region in our farm store on site on the farm. And all these enterprises in a way create this ecosystem and a um, kind of a, the container that allows us to then do all of the pedagogical and cultural and research work that we do, including training the next generation of farmers through our farm apprentices pro apprenticeship program. We uh, formed something called CRAFT, the Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmer Training. We started a, a um, chapter of farm beginnings in the Hudson Valley, a whole farm planning, and we work with collaborative partners on making farming as a vocation available to returning veterans, incarcerated people, uh, migrant, immigrant communities. Our Institute for Mindful Agriculture is actually trying to help cultivate the inner soil of the farmers. And our Farmscape Ecology Program is doing agroecological research on behalf of the entire farming community in our county and now spreading throughout the uh, Hudson Valley, really inviting a uh, opportunity for a more compassionate view of the land. We have uh, visual arts initiatives, theater arts, we have a publishing press. We have the Alkion Center for Adult Education, which is doing Waldorf teacher training. Some of those people who have gone through the training program end up teaching at Hawthorne Valley Waldorf School, which is a K through 12 independent day school on the farm. One program in that school is meeting the needs of children who have uh, different learning modalities. It's called Earth Program. And those children are getting their education primarily on the farm and in the forest. And I would have to say Hawthorne Valley remains a work in progress and we're constantly trying to adapt and address the needs of our time. And uh, next year, with, in collaboration with the Good Work Institute, we're going to start Place Corps. And it's a gap year type program for 18 to 25 year olds, which is meant to cultivate a calling to know, love, and serve our places. Place-based education, education of the will, learning by doing, these are all core ideals right from the very beginning. Uh, in 1972, the first class of visiting students came from New York City. Every week since then, we have a class of students from either New York City, Baltimore, Boston, Washington, D.C., coming up and living for a week on the farm, doing agroecological related activities. And then we convert that to summer camps, and have also residential and day programming uh, during the summer. About 600 children a year 
in the residential programs and maybe just as many coming for the day programs. It's always gratifying to see, to relive this story over and over for children coming and having this connection the first time and going out and pulling a carrot or a radish out of the ground and eyes as big as saucers. And food comes from the ground. And if it doesn't take clairvoyance to just see the, the wheels start spinning and you can see they're beginning to reconnect to, to essential parts of themselves and remember themselves into this larger story. So my beloved wife is an early childhood teacher at Hawthorne Valley Walter School and uh, she shares her impressions with me and I would like to share one of them with you because it's just so, uh, so beautiful. I invite you to join me on a walk with her and her kindergartners through the pasture. The bees are busy harvesting the first full flowering of golden pollen. White clouds sail across the blue vault of heaven while beneath the children are just as busy as the bees. Their senses are harvesting the world. They delight in the rippling waters of the creek, the song of the robin, the season's first butterflies. <coughs> Look, our cows. They run to the edge of the field to gaze at the dairy herd grazing on the lush sweet grass. The cows placidly look up with peaceful eyes, then turn back to their ruminating work. I wonder, do the cows think of these children as theirs as well? Their milk nourishes these children like their calves. Each week the children visit the dairy and thank the farmer and the creamery workers for the yogurt that they get to bring back to the kindergarten. This quality of life and relationship is part of the education of the children. Here, living and learning are multidimensional. The children are at one with this world that speaks of an integrated harmony. They feel the fields, forests, cows, sheep, and farmers as theirs, not because they own them, but because they are part of them. The children live and learn within this wholeness of life. We all live and learn through these relationships. They are realized when we take time to connect to our place and be present to each other. This is essential for children if they are to understand the truth of the world. It is, it is the contextual foundation for, for all learning. It is the gift of our place, and it is a gift in our time. Do you get service? A kindergartner asks as she picks up a stone from the creek and imitates a cell phone gesture. I think so, replies her friend. I like to ponder the voice of the stone, to think that this Rock of Ages has a message for our children. I think we all need to listen to the stones, to the earth, to the water. They are the beings of service. They serve us all and help make life flourish. Yes, we get service here. The farmers who bring the cows in before dawn to milk them or put the cow's manure into the soil to build fertility are living in service. The teachers who help the children strive for the truth to correct their mistakes when they are made are striving to serve them. The coworkers who come and try to make each day a little more beautiful for all of us are in service. The parents who make sacrifices so that their children can attend a Waldorf school are in service to their children's future. Volunteers who serve on boards, committees, community service are all providing service. When we serve, we are also ourselves served because our life 
in service to our community, our work in service to our community means our needs will be met. This to me is the reality of our life, our integrated life on this, on this earth, this, this unity of life in our universe. And this picture was taken actually on, as I understand it, December 24th, 1968, which would make this Christmas Eve the 50th anniversary of this photograph. And I'm involved in a little project called Earthrise 50, basically to invite people to uh, hold our Earth in our loving awareness while we approach this anniversary. So these are my ruminations as I walk down the cow path every morning with my granddaughter to walk her to school down the same cow path I walked her mother to school on. This is the, the wealth of places. All places have their inherent wealth like all people. And it is my hope that we will uh, all move to this place of mutuality, uh, enlightened reciprocity, compassionate interdependence. And in so doing, this work together will create a place in which it is possible for us all to become, in a true sense, full human beings. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Martin. It was very beautiful, very touching, this evocation of the life of Hawthorne Valley is a great exemplar of how we can aspire to live and work together. Thank you so much, and we will definitely want you back at Vintorn. It's very much what we're trying to do, as you know, to aspire to live in such a way here also. So it's now an enormous pleasure to introduce Jude Caravan. Where's she gone? She's just disappeared. <laughs> she will be back. She's just getting wired up. Um, really, it's a great pleasure to introduce her because in the last three months, I've probably heard her name about a dozen times. Every time I go somewhere, someone says, we must meet Jude Caravan. Have you met Jude Caravan? Jude Caravan, you really need to know her. And I thought, wow, she's actually going to be here, and I'm going to get to know her, and we're all going to get to know her. And she is an extraordinary person. She's really an extraordinary person. She's a cosmologist. She's a planetary healer. She's a futurist. She's an author. She grew up the daughter of a coal miner in the north of England. She's since then traveled to at least 70 different countries around the world. She currently lives in Avebury in the southwest of England, a very sacred and ancient part of England. And she has an extraordinary CV. She's been a very senior businesswoman in the UK uh, for many years and has also attained a PhD in archaeology from the University of Reading in the UK, researching ancient cosmologies. She has a master's degree in physics from Oxford University, specializing in cosmology and quantum physics. She's the author of six non-fiction books, currently available in 15 languages in 25 countries. In 2010, she was presented with a Circle Award by One Buddhism International, cited for her outstanding contribution towards planetary healing and expanding new forms of consciousness. And in 2014, she was invited to become a member of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle. That includes Deepak Chopra, Barbara Marx Hubbard, and Jean Houston. So enormously impressive CV. And we are delighted to welcome you back to Fintorn. You did come for half a day 20 years ago. So welcome back. And please give a very warm welcome to Jude Caravan. <laughs> Thank you. Heavens, how do you follow that? Um, hello, everybody. It is a delight to be back after 20 years. And I remember, the, the thing that I remember 20 years ago was being in the Universal Hall. And so it's especially a delight to be back here and with you all. Um, my goodness, we are on this threshold. We are at this point of potential breakdown and breakthrough. And I love that idea of the paradox, that it can be both. 
but we've also been exploring this evening what drives us, what makes us behave in the way we do behave. And I would suggest to you that it's our worldview. It's how do we understand the nature of reality? And how, when we understand the nature of reality, does that influence us, drive us, support us in behaving the way we do? And some years back, I was uh, invited to be a keynote listener. I thought, that's interesting, keynote listener. A keynote listener at a, a, an event conference in Denmark. And the purpose of the conference was to explore the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals that the United Nations had recently signed off with something like 193 countries signing up to them. So for the first day of the conference, I sat very dutifully as a keynote listener and was absolutely encouraged and hopeful and full of joy at this passion of everyone there to go out and implement these Sustainable Development Goals. But as the day went on, I had a sense something wasn't fully resonating with me. So at the end of the day, the organisers came up to me and said, what do you think? You've been a keynote listener all day, what do you think? And I said, mm, fantastic, but I think there's a hole, H-O-L-E, in the middle of what you're looking at, and I sense you're missing the hole, W-H-O-L-E. Because as a healer, I also appreciate that if we have a disease, we will have symptoms of that disease. Okay? So for me, the sustainable development goals were responses to our dysfunctional behaviours, which are the symptoms, in my perspective, of our collective disease of a fragmented worldview. So if that's the case, we can do all that we can do, and it's wonderful work. And my goodness me, what we've heard tonight is totally inspirational. But on a collective level, and given the scaling up and speeding up of our needful responses to the current global emergency that we have, and the breakdown that is happening, potentially as part of also a breakthrough, are we able to heal the collective disease of our worldview. And for me, that's the fragmented understanding, the partial understanding of the nature of reality itself. So for 62 years, since I was four years old, when a discarnate light came into my bedroom and started to communicate with me, and I started to walk between worlds and communicate with and learn from the subtle realms, I started to have what I call supernormal experiences, not supernatural, not paranormal, but supernormal experiences of telepathy and precognitive dreams and remote sensing. And I was walking on this incredibly solid looking, gorgeous planetary home of ours. How did all this come together? How did all the experiences I was having connect with my experience and our experience as a physical reality. And I love that I'm standing here sharing all this with you because three days ago I was in the Vatican Museums in the Sistine Chapel and I looked up and there above me was this incredible depiction of Michelangelo of the finger of God reaching out to the finger of man and realising that divine spark that is within all of us, and not just within all of us, but is all that there is. So this evening is all about sharing very briefly a revolution, because our collective worldview is to a great degree currently influenced by the scientific paradigm, the mainstream scientific paradigm of what the nature of reality is. And that paradigm is one of materialism, solely materialism, and separation. And the elephant in the room that it ignores or peripheralizes is the nature of consciousness itself. So after 62 years <laughs> of exploring, because that's what cosmologists do, we're just curious. We just want to ask why, 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 as well as how, how, how. So, my sense is now we're at potentially a game-changer moment where we do have the opportunity, if we're prepared, to turn around 
And instead of coming from a sense of separation and merely materialistic reality, we turn around and realize that all that we call reality is essentially unified. And playing out on many, many, many multidimensional realms, multiverses, the joyous diversity, the abundance of what Einstein called cosmic mind. But this is where we're at because the leading edge of science is revealing that that materialist, separate, exclusive of consciousness paradigm is wrong. It's innately wrong. So for the rest of my time this evening, I'd like to share some of this with you and that I wrote about in the book. I did the heavy lifting in the book. I spent two and a half years amassing all the leading edge research and discoveries and evidence of what I'm going to share tonight, which is coming through at all scales of existence and numerous fields of research to show an amazingly exquisite, simple understanding of the wholeness and the unity of reality, but played out in the most incredible diversity. Our universe was born 13.8 billion years ago, not in a big bang. It wasn't big and it wasn't a bang. It wasn't that shrapnel, chaotic perspective. Instead, our universe began and continues very similar to the ancient Vedic Indian tradition of a big breath, an out breath of Brahman, with time flowing and space expanding and an innate evolutionary impulse, not just from simplicity to complexity, but our universe existing and evolving as a unified and coherent entity. From that very first moment where the laws of physics were algorithmic instructions of how to relate through to their ability from its simplest state to then create elements and stars and galaxies and beloved planetary homes such as Mother Earth. So let's go back to where we're coming from on this. We know that every cell in our human body, of which at least 50%, possibly up to 90%, are not actually human. We are a community. Our bodies are a community of human cells, of, of mitochondria, of bacteria, of viruses, of fungi. We're a community. But every single cell in our body has purpose, has meaning, and has an effect on the whole. We're now beginning to understand through this leading edge wave of scientific research that we are cells in the body of our universe. Just as every cell in our body, nothing is redundant, nothing's by accident. So we as cells in the evolutionary impulse of our universe are like a cluster, an organism amongst other organisms on a planetary home which is herself a living being within a solar system that we could even call a solar S-O-U-L-A-R system the planets are in resonance with each other. We are at a perfect distance from our star to enable biological life to exist. But we come from stars. Three generations of stars came to our planetary system where elements were created through their life cycles. The earliest stars in our universe lived hard and died young. They were all like rock stars, but what they did was they seeded the interstellar medium. <laughs> I should start playing air guitar now, but I won't. Um, <laughs> the interstellar medium. So by the time five billion years ago came round, we had everything in the interstellar birthing fields to create a solar system, which enabled rocky planets such as Earth to form and actually be a home to every nutrient, everything that was needed for then that next stage in the evolutionary impulse of our universe, which was the, was, was the evolution and emergence of biological life, and so on and so on. We are part of the evolutionary impulse of our universe. We have a meaning, we have a purpose. The scientific revolution of the 17th century through the 20th century, whilst it still talks about space and time and things. It still talks about energy and matter. 
Each of those scientific progressions have been incredible. They've deepened our awareness of the nature of physical reality. But they still primarily are based on a perception of our universe being made up of separate things, whether it's people, whether it's planets, whether it's galaxies, whatever it may be, at all scales. What we're now realizing is that whilst reality is real, separation is illusory. That essentially our universe exists and evolves as not just a fundamentally interconnected entity that is coherent and has this innate evolutionary impulse from simplicity to diversity to complexity to ever greater levels of self-awareness, but it is ultimately unified Physical reality is extremely ephemeral. It feels solid, but when we drill down to quantum levels and, and lower, we realize that it's 99.9999999999% no thingness. And what's left are excitations of fields, relationships. But crucially, and this is where I think the real breakthrough is now happening. And this is evidence, We've had it, we have experimental evidence to support this point, as well as the theoretical framework to support it, is that in formation, in formation, the same digitized information that enables our technologies is physical. When we store or delete one bit of information, physical work is done, physical heat is generated. Information we're realizing when we dig deep below all scales of the physicalized reality is more fundamental than energy, matter, and space time. Not only this, but the work that we've done on black holes is also offering a holographic perspective into the piece. And like Daniel, this is sort of trying to take, a, as my mom used to say, a quart into a pint pot in terms of exploration. But hopefully, you'll get the sense of this. Just as a hologram, captures information from a three-dimensional object and then projects it into a two-dimensional analysis of that information so that when we throw a beam of light through that 2D film, the hologram is projected. The appearance of the physical object is projected. Cosmologists are realizing that the digital information of our technologies is not only the same as the digitized information that underpins and innately informs all that we call the reality of our universe, but that our universe as a whole takes information on its boundary of space and literally projects what we call physical reality as its appearance. So information expresses itself in complementary ways as energy and matter and space-time. But our entire universe is an emergent phenomenon from deeper non-physicalized realms of causation and meaning and intelligence. Because when I talk about information, I'm not talking about random data. I'm talking about information expressed as laws of physics, as principles enabling our universe to exist and evolve. We are in formation. In formation literally informs the nature of reality. We inform and are informed by the whole universe. Our universe exists and evolves as a unified, and what we're now realizing, and again, we have more and more evidence to support this, as a finite entity with a finite beginning 13.8 billion years ago and a likely finite end, maybe tens of billions of years hence. And ever, each month now, more and more evidence, more and more discoveries are coming forward to support this. Our universe is informed, pattern, relational and meaningful information. But how's that relevant? Why is it relevant? What does it matter? Well, I think this is why it matters, because we are at a tipping point as a planetary species. And we're not only in our ignorance and misunderstanding causing the damage to ourselves, but we're causing potentially irreparable damage to the whole biosphere of our beloved Mother Earth. 
If we don't change and change radically, as Daniel explained earlier, we don't have a future. So understanding the unified nature of reality may just be the key to remembering who we really are and remembering that we are meaningful co microcosmic co-creators of the evolutionary impulse of our entire universe. And we are children of Gaia. We are relational beings. So instead of coming from this appearance of separation, what I feel this potentially offers us is a remembering of unity. And not just to understand this, but to open the portal to us experiencing life in this way, as you're doing so magnificently in the Hudson Valley, as so many people as Findhorn community are, as so many communities now are seeking this remembering and this wholeness and what does it mean as lived lives, you know, embodied lives day to day. The appearance of our universe arises from these amazing pattern, dynamic, relational attractors. And that particular attractor is called the Lorentz attractor. It underpins the weather of, of, of Gaia through millions of years. And we're finding the patterns, we're finding the informational patterns that come from these deeper causative realms throughout all scales of existence, and not just the natural world, and this is vital, but our human-based realities. Whether natural or man-made, two Harvard astrophysicists, Henry Loeb and Abraham, uh, Abraham Loeb and Henry Lin, recently looked at the population densities of cities and galaxies. And they f the first one in terms of people, the second in terms of stars. And they found that cities and galaxies grow in the same patterned way. It's very difficult, almost impossible, to predict an earthquake because there's no such thing as a typical earthquake. When we look at earthquakes, we find that all earthquakes relate to each other on that top graph. It's called the Gutenberg-Richter power law of the earthquakes. And what it shows is very simple. An earthquake with twice the destructive power is four times less likely to happen. That's it. There's no such thing as an average earthquake. There's just that relation between big earthquakes and small earthquakes along that line. But researchers have looked at human conflicts. Lewis Richardson looked at hundreds of human conflicts just after the Second World War. Neil Johnson and his team at the University of Miami have looked more recently in insurgences in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you can see the relationship. In human conflicts, there is no such thing as an average conflict, whether it's a world war or whether it's a regional hissy fit. What it is, is that a conflict with twice the number of fatalities is four times less likely to happen, same as earthquakes. We find that ecosystems have exactly the same dynamic, holographic, informational patterns as human behaviors. When we look at an anonymized usage of cell phones, of mobile phones, there was an analysis of 10,000 users over three months. And different lifestyles, different times of day, different geographies, different lengths of, of calls. But the underlying patterns for the use of mobile phones is exactly the same as we find in ecosystems. The internet, the nodes, the, the connectivity of the internet is exactly the same as we find in the Amazon rainforest. As microcosmic co-creators of our universe as reality, we're much more powerful than we think we are. What we think, how we feel, what we say, how we do it affects everything, whether we're aware of it or not. So the choices are what do we do, what do we choose, in our everyday lives. This is not just about <laughs> thinking cosmically or even feeling globally. This is acting locally. A friend of mine recently sent me the golden rule from 10 different spiritual traditions. It's the same rule. Treat others, and by others I wouldn't just say human beings, but all the children of Mother Earth and Mother Earth herself as you would like to be treated. What all this is coming to is that mind and consciousness 
aren't something we have. They are not accidental epiphenomena of random evolutionary processes. They're all that is. They are reality itself. It's what we and the whole world are. Our universe, as spiritual traditions have told us, have some pioneering scientists have told us, is far more a great thought than a great thing. And it's our dream as microcosmic co-creators, as participants in its evolutionary impulse, its innate evolutionary impulse, to be, have the opportunity and the invitation to step into this. As Ken Wilber and Dustin De Palma say, wake up, time to wake up, grow up, clean up, show up. I think it's time to add two more to those, link up and lift up. Because when we come from this understanding of unity and really begin to value the uniqueness of each person and each representation of that innate wholeness of the world and value its universal worth and value its universal value, not linked with money, but just because it exists just because it's part of the nature of reality itself, then we can truly link up and lift up. And this may just be our opportunity not to head into the catastrophe of how our misunderstanding has brought us to, but actually to co-create emergence, conscious evolution, from this global emergency. And maybe it's time that we didn't just see ourselves as role models, but inviting the subtle realms to be with us, inviting all the children of Gaia to be with us, to become soul models. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jude, for such a thank you for such a passionate and eloquent linking of the local, the global, the cosmic. It's very inspiring what you bring to us. And also just to, to say you're modest enough to say that tomorrow you're actually running a workshop here. Um, I think in the afternoon. Yeah, in the afternoon. It's in the Universal Hall. There will definitely be more spaces available um, if you feel inspired, as I do, um, by what you've just been sharing with us. So there is a workshop that Jude is running here tomorrow. So I think it's time for a break. Um, we'll have a 15-minute break. The cafe is open, and we will resume with some beautiful music and William Bloom's concluding talk. So enjoy the break, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Do come in, we're going to start again if you would like to take your seats. We are waiting for Elizabeth Moore, our musician. Here you are. Wonderful. Do you want to just take your seat and then I'll introduce you from there? Great. So welcome back. Maybe we could just close the doors so that we have a sense of us. And also really welcome again the people from the live stream. There are now 260 people joining us through live stream from all around the globe. So one of the wonders of our technological age is that we can welcome people from all over the globe. And one of the other wonders is that we can welcome people right into the Universal Hall who are going to play wonderful music for us. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Elizabeth Moore. Elizabeth has been living in the community for a year. She leaves this week. So this is her kind of swan song also. But we love to weave some artistry and some magic into our events in lots of different ways. So a huge welcome to Elizabeth, who's going to share a couple of songs with us. Thank you. Thank you. So this first song, or both of these songs are like good friends of mine. Um, this first song was the first song I ever learned to play on piano, and the only reason I learned how to play piano was so that I could sing. Um, so this song's really nice for transitions. I've been 
been talking to God, don't know if it's helping or not. Surely something is got to, got to, got to give. Cause I can't keep waiting to live. How far do I have to go to get to you? Many the miles, many the miles. Oh, oh. how far do I have to go to get to you? Many the Send me the miles and I'll be happy to yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been talking to God, don't know if it's helping or not. Many the miles, many the miles. Too many things I haven't done yet. Too many sunsets I haven't seen. <laughs> so one of my favorite parts about the Universal Hall is it has, it has this magical energy that makes people start singing. So I intentionally picked a song that everyone knows. And I invite you to please, uh, please sing with me. And um, hearing the talks this evening, it's kind of like music is something that connects us all from, from the heart. So maybe we can practice that together this evening. And um, all is very, very well when we learn to let it be. In times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And when the night is cloudy, there is still a light that shines on me. Shine until tomorrow, let it be. I wake up to the sound of music.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Actually, I need to tell you something, Elizabeth, 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 I need to tell you something. Before you're, you are aware that before you are allowed to leave the Fintorn community, we have to reach a decision by consensus to allow you to leave. So, it may not happen. <laughs> so, thank you so much, it's very beautiful. William's pointing at Thomas, Thomas is looking the other way. You need the clicker? William needs the clicker? The clicker. Somebody in this room has a clicker. <laughs> We're now going to play a very ancient Fintorn game called Hunt the Clicker, where you need to interrogate the person next to you and see if they have a clicker anywhere about their person. It's here. Great. Good. So, it's a great pleasure to welcome William Bloom. William Bloom is an old friend of Fintorn's. He's been coming here since at least 1976. And for about 10 years, he used to teach to new people into the Fintorn community. He used to teach meditation and attunement. In fact, you actually taught me meditation. You probably don't remember this. You taught me meditation at uh, Alternatives in St. James's many, many years ago. He was also a pioneer and founder and director of Alternatives at St. James's Church in Piccadilly, London, which has seen hundreds of inspiring speakers pass through its portals for many, many years. He's now the founder and director of the Spiritual Companions Trust, an educational charity focusing on a holistic and person-centered approach to spirituality and health. And He's actually pioneered through that uh, trust the creation of the first vocational accredited diploma in the UK in practical spirituality and well-being, which he's teaching right now here. So thank you also for taking time out of the course to come to be with us this evening. And he's uh, written 26 books, including The Endorphin Effect, and books about practical spirituality. One of the books that I recommend to a lot of people is this little thin book called First Steps in Spiritual Practice, which I think is really brilliant. And he's just an old friend of our communities, and it's wonderful to welcome him back. And I often think of William as someone who takes spirituality and makes it bite-sized. He kind of takes spirituality and turns it into very practical, this is what you can do on a daily basis to improve your life, to generate well-being, and to connect with something beyond yourself. And who better to talk to us about the future of spirituality, religion, and meditation than William Bloom. Please give him a very warm welcome. That was a very warm introduction. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you for hosting me. Um, this is work in progress. It's a small subject, isn't it? This particular slide will, is up now and will be up at the end of the um, talk and it is, it's the notes for the talk. Um, what you need to know about me to start with is that I'm irritatingly upbeat, irritatingly optimistic and that informs this talk. But what you also need to know about me is that I come from a family of immigrants and refugees. Um, both my parents, who came from families of immigrants and refugees escaping various political persecutions and pogroms, had then spent three years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And I was born to parents that came out of that kind of background. And they were pretty cynical about the human condition. They were realistic about the human condition, so I was brought up in circumstances that were real. And in the middle of all that, I was also having my own experience. From the age of about four or five, I was just going, and it was in the middle of London, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. And it didn't require me to be out in landscape, it just required me to be looking out of the window at the blue sky and thinking, well, that could be the blue of God's eye, couldn't it? Yet at the same time, although I had this, um, Anybody who's lived me, with me will know that I can, you can wake me up at three o'clock in the morning out of a deep sleep and I'll be in a cheerful mood. But in the middle of all that, because of my parents, because of my background, 
I also have a realism about the human condition. And I remember, I'm going to show you a photograph now which confused me at the time. This particular image is of a group of monks watching another monk who, in the middle of the Vietnam War, self-immolated, set fire to himself in order to make a political point. It was a very, very famous image. It's too shocking for me to show you the, want to show you the photograph of him actually burning. But this is a reality check on the human condition that caught me very early on, which was how come there was this beauty and wonder to life, and there was this particular approach to religion and spirituality talking about deep compassion, deep connection, and there in the middle of it was this type of a situation. It was very confusing. So my background also includes doing doctoral research into why people go into war singing. Why do they go into war happy? Why are they, go why are they going into war with music before they may get killed or they may kill? And this image is about human attachment. So here's a lovely woman living in a village, and she has a moment where she has an instinct to be quiet. And she leaves her home with children, she goes and sits by a stream. Shuts her eyes, leans against the tree, and finds the silence self-soothing, easy, beautiful. And she goes there and does it every day, and becomes an instinctive, natural meditator. And a friend of hers spots her and goes, oh, what's she doing? And goes and sits beside her and says, what are you doing? She says, well, I've just found this is really lovely to sit beside a stream and be quiet. And her friend says, well, can I do it? And her friend says, yes, why don't you just lean against a tree and just notice the noises of the river? And her friend goes, oh, that's nice. And then her friend invites another friend to come and do it. And her friend invites another friend, and it builds up. And we, ha we have a school of meditation now where you have to sit out in landscape with your back against a tree and listen to the water. But somewhere else on the planet, there's another woman who's suddenly had enough of her children and her family. She needs to take some quiet as well. She goes out of the house and goes sits somewhere very quiet. And she's pretty, she's tense and she's had enough. And she goes, <sighs> <sighs> starts to breathe. Another friend sees her and says, what are you doing? And she says, look, I'm sitting quietly, it's really good for me, and this is what I do with my breath in order to chill myself out. And her friend says, well, that's a great idea, I'm going to do it as well. And she calls another friend in. We now have another school of meditation, which is about 100 miles away, where they're using breath in a certain way. And over here, we've got another school of meditation, where you have to sit beside a tree. And what's happened is the little ducklings have attached. They've attached to their idea of how, how to do it. And throughout religion and spirituality, you can see exactly the same problem. I, I like to focus particularly on men's hairdos. Um, you know, somewhere along the line, there's a guy who has a great mystic experience. He has lots of hair, and he, because of the way the monkey mind works, he interprets it as, oh, my hair is like a, an electric antenna, so everybody in his group now has to grow long hair in order to catch the God vibes. But somewhere else, there's another guy who's decided, because he's going bald, right? <laughs> that the only way you can catch the God vibes is if you've got a bald pate, and there's somewhere else on the planet where someone's put a ponytail on top of their head so that God can pull him up. <clears throat> <laughs> and you have these attachments. And it's the attachments, it's the primal urge to attach to that has created the challenges in religion. And I name this as being a very poignant part of the human condition. The, here is 
the beginning of the um, optimistic perspective. The World Values Survey, which interviews tens of thousands of people, has shown that when folk, what's happened? It's switched off. In societies where there's social and political control, ignorance, fear, and hunger, fundamentalism grows. In societies where there's education, political freedom and safety, you get a different approach to spirituality. I'll switch it off again. Which is generalized, diverse, inclusive, expansive, and holistic. Can you press, this is, um, now just pause a moment. The good news ignores the temporary crisis we're in. And it puts it in the framework of 10,000 years. Go back 5,000 years, no Christianity, no Buddhism, no Islam, no Hinduism as we know it. We don't know what it's going to look like in several thousand years, but what we do know at the moment is that all the religions that are the global faith communities reflect patriarchal structures. They are mainly men. They have a top CEO, middle management, lower management, oi polloi. Churches, temples are similarly constructed. They can powerfully manipulate the way in which people attach. So when you have the image of the beautiful goose followed by her little goslings, you have the same thing happening in religions, but in a structured way where the power is manipulated to hold the people and move them forward. But when patriarchy starts to deconstruct, when people are educated, when people are psychologically secure, there's a key word, psychologically secure, then things start to shift. Thomas, press the button on the bottom. Can you do it? This is a little video. Can you do it, do it or not? There we go. These are just the changes over the last 15 years. Okay. Those changes extrapolated forward 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, take us back into this. And we immediately have a very clear picture that builds on everything we've been talking about this evening, is if things are cared for, if people feel safe, and people feel safe is part and parcel of being in a safe environment, then they move forward into a space of personal self-management, autonomy, maturity, self-responsibility. This is good news. The challenge for us as a species is to balance out attachment with the usefulness of community. If, if I am anywhere on this planet and I, and I have got nothing to eat and I'm on the streets, I will go to a temple, a church, a synagogue, a mosque, and I know that I will get some care if I ask for it. So there are huge benefits to community, which traditional faiths nurture. And we have to work out that particular equation. I like it. I like it because it describes the human condition and it describes 
how each of us, whether it's the Fintong community, the Christian community, a wider community of Greens, socialists, we have our attachments, at the same time we need to be able to individuate out of them and yet use the community as a form of self-nurture and campaigning. Emphasis. As we move culturally and socially into a frame of mind that has psychological security and therefore can explore uh, with mature autonomy spirituality, we see what we at Fintorn, for example, are very familiar with, ch choices in how you do spirituality. Dance, yoga, meditation, food, singing, caring. In the program we've developed, for example, in the, <clears throat> in the Spiritual Companions Trust, we do something which is very normal, which is we ask people, in what circumstances do you most easily connect with the wonder and beauty of life? We don't tell them how to do it. We ask, how, how do you do it? Where do you do it? And what kind of style do you do this in? Are you an introvert? You're an intellectual? You're, you are a recluse, a radical, a purist, a psychic? What is your style? And we build on what a person's natural and individualistic approach to spirituality is. And, and you, need, you need to hear this. In situations where people feel safe, this is what is normal. It's normal to explore. If you like wine, it's not normal to just stay with one type of wine you taste. If you like music, it's not normal to stay with one type of music. You explore different types of music in order to understand what touches your heart most, what you want to explore, what you want to deepen. And spirituality is similar. It's not something to be boxed in. And, th and we're seeing this happening all across the world to the irritation of people who are deep in their own faith communities. They look at us, accuse us of being a, sm a supermarket approach to spirituality, a smorgasbord approach, but in actual fact, it's a mature, autonomous, self-responsible, self-managing exploration of spirituality and religion in general, and it is a profound and important step forward. The beauty is there. The major criticism that traditional faiths accuse us of, excuse me one I accuse us of is that we have no roots and we have no ethics. And that accusation comes often and with force and sarcasm and some venom at us. And I would say back to them, one, we plat together, we intertwine the ethics of all the world's faiths so that they are not in competition with each other, but they are unified, woven together to make an even stronger ethic where there is absolutely no disagreement about love thy neighbor, do not kill, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself, the golden rule. It's plattered together so it's stronger. Two, Secondly, we belong to the first generation where mass society as a whole is beginning to adopt green ethics and a deep 
understanding that our relationship with the Earth is not just to do with sustainability, not just to do with the future of humanity, but is to do with our community, with all living things. So we have the plat of all the world's religions. We have green ethics. More than that, we have another set of ethics. And we are the first generation to push this one through, emerging out of all the developmental psychology of the last hundred years, is the absolute clear understanding that babies, children, teenagers, adults, older people need love and affection in order to develop. In order to develop healthily and in order to create healthy societies. And love and affection is not a sentimental option that religionists or emotionally sensitive people may put forward as a poetic idea, but is a fundamental need in a healthy and balanced society. So you have the platting of the ethics of the world religions with the green ethics, which are also to do with love, love of the green community, and then the explicit psychological insights that come out of what we know that people need in order to develop and create healthy societies. And then fourthly, there is a metaphysical ethic that we know about. And the metaphysical ethic is, you can't get away with a bad vibe. And I say to those <coughs> flat earth, scientific types who say there's no such thing as vibes, I will say to them, when you rented or bought your home, your flat, your apartment, did you not check out the atmosphere of the place? And they go, yes, of course I did. And I go, yeah. <laughs> you know, if your partner or your teenage children come home in a bad mood, do you not feel it the moment they walk in the door? And they go, yes. And I go, fine. So we bring in that there, there will be a normalization of a certain type of metaphysics which recognizes the linking between thought, emotion, consciousness, mood, and how that affects other people. And the notion of what's called social contagion in social sciences, that, that our moods affect other people, will be mapped out in terms of our vibes. So we now have four clear deep sets of ethics, the platting of the world's religions ethics, deep green love for the community of life that we're part of, and an absolute necessity to give each other love and affection, because that's what we need to develop and create a good society, and have a good vibe. All of this I know is part and parcel of what people in our community almost take for granted. But you need to realize that it's new, it's cutting edge, and it's the homeopathic taste of why all will be well. All will be very well. Well, that's me. Thank you very much, William, again for your clarity and also for simplifying things, but in a way that's also really grounded in a lot of experience and a lot of, a lot of depth and a lot of wisdom. And I also actually want to take a moment just to thank you for, for standing for this movement, if you like, in the UK. I think you're one of the people who's done most, if not the most, within the UK to really stand for and articulate what holism and what this kind of spiritual movement, we might call it the New Age movement or holism or however you want to language it, you've done a lot to kind of really stand for that and to articulate that and to argue for that and I just want to really honor and appreciate you for that. I think you've done a great job for many, many years. So let's 
let's set up a panel here. We need some, we need a Thomas who's going to tell us how to do that. We'll just get some chairs here, I guess. And we will, in a moment, maybe we can have some lights on our friends in the audience here, in the auditorium. Can we have some light here so we can see each other? Because this is a chance to ask some questions of anybody on the panel. And I want to invite you to, you can ask a question to an individual on the panel, you can ask a question to the panel as a whole. I do want to uh, remind you what a question is. <laughs> So it generally ends with a question mark, it's not a speech, and, and it is an opportunity for it to hear a few voices that have a, a question or something kind of bubbling in you as a result of the, the great talks that we've just heard. And we'll probably take two or three as a bunch and then pass them to the panel to respond to. So if you want to sit in whatever order you want to. And we have some microphones that are going to roam around. I can go in the middle if you like. Do we have the roving mics somewhere? We do? Great. So. Who has a hand up at the back here? And one here. Great. So let's, we're going to hear a couple, let's take three questions as a whole and then we'll kind of pass them to you to field. And maybe you could just say who you are when you ask the question also. Thank you. I'm Steve Cunningham. I'm a visitor to Scotland in Finhorn from Alaska. And Welcome. I would just like to get the panel's thoughts on two different things, the Baha'i faith and Jordan Peterson, if they have any knowledge. The Baha'i faith? The Baha'i faith. And Jordan, and Jordan Peterson. Peterson. You want to explain who Jordan Peterson is for people who don't uh, know? Jordan Peterson is a former University of Toronto professor, clinical psychologist. He's working with a lot of young people these days. And uh, he's recently written a book called 12 Rules for Life to give young people meaning in the seemingly hopeless situation they find themselves in. And the Baha'i faith claims to be a universal religion, uniting all the former religions. Okay, great, let's hold that question. We'll take one at the back here. You could introduce yourself also. Yeah, uh, my name's John Lardner. Um, my, my question really is a, a, num a number of the speakers um, emphasized the significance of paradox um, in their understanding. And it seems to me that we're living in an age in the mainstream where paradoxes are increasingly being uh, vilified and um, uh, trying to escape from, from paradox. And I wondered what the view of the panel was, whether they could elaborate more on the importance of paradox as a way of emerging from this very, very narrow, restricted uh, way of living that we're in at the moment. Great, thank you. Let's maybe start with those two. So a question about the nature of paradox and also about Jordan Peterson and the Baha'i faith. Who would like to kick off? <laughs> I can't say much about um, Jordan Peterson, I don't know about him. I um, have met a few Baha'is and they all were wonderful people, but that's really all I can say about that. But uh, about the paradox, um, if we take it to what we learned about this great thought that is one big whole that needs to, we need the separation in order to have a perspective on it, but we at the same time that whole, we're waves in that ocean. That invites us into understanding that this belief that if I hold one view and somebody else holds the seemingly exclusive other view, then one of us needs to be wrong. But that's a mistake if, like, if, if what we really need is lots of different angles on reality and sometimes um, they seem to be mutually exclusive, but actually when, when we work with that polarity, then we enter into a deeper understanding of our participation and co-creation of this whole. Um, so I think putting paradoxes away or saying, oh, that, well, that doesn't make any sense because it's mutually exclusive, um, is a way of keeping us in the story of separation and stopping us from experiencing 
into being and co-creation. Thanks, Daniel. I'd, I'd like to add to that, if I might. I'm afraid I don't know Jordan's work either, um, and a limited perspective of the Baha'is. I guess where I'm having a sense of is that the whole universe exists and evolves as essentially a universe soul of this unity expressed in diversity. So our whole experience of differentiation and diversity is innately embedded in the evolutionary impulse of the universe, which also speaks to your point on, on the appearance of, of, of paradox. But also it suggests again, I think what William was saying is that as, we, as we're able to feel free, as we're f able to feel authentic, as we're f able to, to literally step into our conscious co-creativity, there are many roads up the same mountain you know, in terms of spiritual practice, in terms of religious, cultural perspectives, there are many roads up the same mountain. And I think to say there is one religion, however apparently generic it is, suggests that there is still that path. It may be very broad. And my sense is that our emergence, our conscious evolutionary potential enables us to welcome and celebrate that diversity, and also find ways perhaps of reconciling apparent paradox. I talk about, you know, duality to polarity to relativity, so that we are aware of being in relationship with all life, in the sense that it, appear, it can appear very different, but ultimately it is part of that ultimate wholeness, but expressed in amazing, abundant diversity and differentiation. Thank you. Do you want to add? When I uh, teach my grade 12 economics block, I often think of subtitling it, Welcome to Paradox. I think it's a great question, and I can think of any, in any given moment, uh, how I'm experiencing it. I'm very much aware of uh, the IPCC. Uh, findings released this week and I flew to Scotland in the same week so if that's not a paradox I don't know what is and I look at uh, actually this rug here is a great example we could each take points on this rug and be kind of across from each other in seeming polarity and yet we do have the possibility of uh, reconstructing the whole picture out of that and I it always seems to me that that's just about the definition of what it means to be human. How do we hold that center and, and uh, redefine the whole? Oh, I'll just say something obvious. Um, just being incarnate is a paradox, isn't it? Yeah, cre creatures with cosmic consciousness strung out between biological instincts and developmental soul-inspired expansion. Yeah, oh. <laughs> it's paradox, and it requires some maturity to be at ease with it. And sometimes I see that maturity in children who are just at ease with it, and yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's see if there's other questions that want to emerge at the back here. Maybe there's two at the back. Oh, there's one over here also. I can't see you're a bit in the dark, but there's somebody here and somebody, a woman here in the row before the back. There's one here with a microphone. There's one there with a microphone also. Oh, Roger in the crowd. Yeah. But let's hear from you first. Yeah. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone for your talks, and I strongly resonate with a lot of what was said. Um, I just wanted to say that after the IPCC report, I after already having lost a lot of hope, I read that the Australian government had refused to stop coal mining. And so I just wonder how all of the approaches that you've mentioned can filter into politics, because I feel like at the moment, whilst changes are happening um, in the political spectrum, it doesn't seem to be the case so much, and it still dominates a lot of, of how the world works. So I would okay. like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. So Thank one you. question about politics. Roger, you want to add? We're just taking a couple together. Yeah, in, in a way it's the same, same kind of theme. Um, 
After the announcement of the latest UN uh, climate change panel, um, the BBC ran an interesting program called The Moral Maze. And the key question that they were looking at was, um, is it moral, is it more moral to curtail the welfare of people who are already alive and are already struggling, predominantly in the developing world, um, dependent upon cheap electricity for any sense of progress, is it more moral to look after their needs than it is to consider the welfare of people who are not even yet born? 2050 on down the road uh, in a planet which may be increasing, will be probably increasingly uninhabitable. And you know, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know you or you do. Okay, so a question about how we might take some of this awareness here into the political arena and a question about the morality of caring for future generations in a way that you frame it at the expense of people who are currently alive, particularly in the global south. So who would like to respond to that first? Jude? Um, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, as, a, as a healer, I was invited after the US election in November 2016 to contribute to a manifesto guided by Irvin Laszlo called Beyond Fear and Rage. And I wrote a piece called The Flickering of Hope. And what I wrote in there was that when complex systems are ready to change, when they're at the point of breakdown potentially, then what you find on those underlying attractors I showed earlier is you get the limits of the behavior of a system beginning to just break down. But you also get the potentializing of a higher level of coherence of possibility also forming. And what you have is a, what's called a bifurcation point. But in that bifurcation point, which can be breakdown and or breakthrough, you have something called flickering, where there is a flickering between the old system that is essentially falling apart and the potentizing of the, the higher level of coherence. And they flicker between the two. And if there is sufficient, if you like, consciousness, is a sufficient essence to that high level coherence, the system streams through to that. And that is essentially, as we're finding in informational terms as well, which of course is consciousness expressing itself as information, emergence, it's biological emergence. So it seems to me that as a collective psyche, as we are all interconnected, there are areas of our collective psyche that has, that still embodies trauma from all the appearance of separation that we've been through for so long. And that's energizing, as it were, the, the, the current you know, unsustainable situation. But there's also a higher level of coherence. So as I go around the world, I'm seeing incredible, incredible um, movements that are gaining momentum and accelerating, such as what you're doing in the Hudson, what William's been doing, what you've been doing, Daniel, um, but across the world, as well as the breakdown. And I think we're in this time of flickering. And it's almost as though we're in the birth canal of conscious evolution. And when we're in the birth canal, I'm not a mum, but my mum used to help the local midwife. And her advice was always breathe and push. <laughs> So that's the sense I have, and I think that's the sense on the political side as well, because we're seeing that, and it's on the sense that you were talking about, Roger, as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. I've got, I've got two thoughts. One is always, always, always keep on campaigning. Keep on campaigning. Keep on campaigning. Yet, simultaneously, step back and celebrate the level of debate that's going on because the apparent disaster is not going on silently. There are huge arguments, there are huge debates, there are huge pushes to get appropriate legislation in. Battles will be lost, 
apparently wars occasionally will be lost, but keep on campaigning and keep your eye on the fact that it's a hot subject and that's to be celebrated. Nobody is going through all this apathetically. And that for me is a huge indication that humanity as a whole is waking up to its self-responsibility in relation to its environment. So keep on campaigning, but don't get depressed by the bad news. Because you get depressed by the bad news, you're just going to shovel more shit onto it. You know, the vibe doesn't work. Keep campaigning and hang out with people who've got a, an eye on the long picture and the fact that it, it's tough now, but we'll be okay. I, uh, I have to check in with myself because that's really like the locus of control that I have in how am I dealing with these questions, which are large and challenging. And uh, it's quite easy to become cynical in the political sphere, especially in the country that I'm from. And uh, I feel that in this process of becoming human, which I think we're still on that journey, where um, we need to connect to our deepest source of who we are. And uh, my dear friend Otto Scharmer would say, we need to approach that with an open mind, open heart, and open will. And it's our own voices of judgment, our own voices of cynicism, and our own voices of fear that will prevent us from doing that. So this is what I have to do. I know the work that I have to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to echo this internal locus of control. Um, it's one of the key principles of regenerative development is that it starts within. And to be facing the current political <laughs> situation in a lot of countries, um, what's going on in Brazil as well at the moment is very concerning. Um, I think we, we need to keep campaigning, we need to keep calling political leaders out for being in bed with money. Um, but I think that there's something powerful about this bi-regional approach to bring politics back to the scale where people have an interaction at the local and bi-regional level, where I, as we're moving into a regenerative, like if, if we get it right and this century will be remembered as the century of earth regeneration, then I also think we will be a long way towards the abolishment of na nation states. I don't think that the nation state is um, fit for the 22nd century. Um, we, it, it's part of that era of empires. It's defining us against other. Um, my, one of my favorite musicians, Michael Franti, says, you, you love just one nation and the whole world will, will divide. Um, if we bring it back down to the level of bioregionalism, we can see how our actions, and this is beginning to answer Roger's question, um, I don't think that there's a... Um, dynamic of, of tension between present generations and future generations. Um, the, the path of regenerative development is a path where we are moving towards healing the ecosystems um, which creates jobs, which creates a re-regionalization of production and consumption towards biomaterials, and that actually improves the conditions of this generation. And in doing so, we'll set the scene for improving the, the, the conditions of future generations. Thank you. I think we'll draw our proceedings to a close now to honor our time commitments and also your energy and also your energy. And I want to do that with, a, with many thank yous, actually. First of all, huge thank you to four fantastic speakers and a great panel, to Daniel, Jude, Martin, and William. Thank you so much. It's been a it's been a fantastic fantastic launching of Fintorn Talks. Stay tuned. I'm sure there will be more. 
So, and also a huge thank you to John Clawson for an enormous amount of work to get it together, and to Thomas George also for supporting that. Many thanks to all of you. Thanks to our sponsors, the Fintorn Foundation, AES Solar, Phoenix Cafe and Shop, and the Hygieia Foundation for enabling this to happen. I think round of applause definitely for our sponsors. And to our... All our technical folk, the people who are helping the live stream to happen, we've got a great team of people filming this. We've had over 260 people able to watch and absorb and um, benefit from this through the efforts of our technicians, people at the sound desk, the lighting folk. Let's also appreciate them. So many thanks to all of you. And let's also close with a moment of quiet and stillness as we start it. I want to invite you to close your eyes if you wish and just create, however you do it, a little inner spaciousness. And take a moment to notice how you are. In your body, your heart, your mind, your spirit. What has moved and touched you this evening? What has maybe concerned or irritated you this evening? Just being present to all of your experience and welcoming it all. Noticing also what conversations or movements you want to continue or deepen. And let's just have a moment of gratitude for all that has transpired this evening. Our inner experience, our outer experience. All the beings that have supported this, seen and unseen. And let's dedicate this time to the good of all beings. To the unfolding of the highest and the best. And let's give thanks that it is so. Thank you, beloved. Thank you, beloveds. Thank you for coming, and God bless and go well. And may we just have a final round of applause for Robin, who's done an amazing job this evening. <laughs>